All God's people said, Amen. It's a wonderful day, and we have come to give God the glory and honor, and we pray that everything that is accomplished this day will do just that. It's a delight to have our guest, special guest with us, Dr. Ted Lee, who will be our speaker, by the way, all day, so we invite you to stay right here this afternoon. It will take you that long to get a meal, so you might as well just plan to stay here and come back tonight after the morning service, and uh, Brian Allen is going to be our guest soloist in our last song, and all of you are a very special guest, along with a very fine young man, Tyler Martin Brock, who came all the way from Augusta, Georgia, just to hear Dr. Lee speak this morning. A brand new baby, and he's the grandson of Jim and Vivian Schweigert. But again, it's just a delight to have each of you in our service this morning. In your bulletins, you'll find, among other things, a registration card. We would encourage everyone to fill that out for us. It gives us a chance to just say thank you for being with us on this very special occasion. We especially, uh, obviously, want to welcome our homecoming visitors. I'm just curious enough, it's just a pastor's curiosity, how many used to attend this church when you lived in Kankakee and were a part of the Olivet community? Would you stand? We'd just like to see you. You were here back all those years ago. Let's give them a nice applause. We have your transfers here, and you can come back today. It will be all right. Now, just a little uh, house. Uh, keeping business for our own people. We begin our revival next Sunday. Our children's revival actually begins on Saturday with Mark and Debbie Hammond, and we need workers. And uh, so today, if you could just look at that little insert there about children's workers, if you could help one night, we just plan on children being saved during this revival. And uh, we can honestly say no one has ever stood so tall as when they have knelt to pray with a child. And if you could help one of those nights, just fill that out for us, and Pastor Cindy will get it and contact you. But we do need workers each night, and we're just expecting a wonderful revival, of course, in the children's department, and, of course, in our own revival that begins next Sunday with Dr. Dick Strickland and Bill Cobb with the music. We're just looking for a wonderful time, and you're here this morning to help us to kick off a wonderful, wonderful revival. Again, I want to apologize for the cold air out in the foyer. Uh, we've had some storms around here, folks, and the one just a little over a week ago took off our entryway. It's being repaired. We'd like to have had it here for today, but it just wasn't possible. And also for our own people, I want to thank you for the special love offering that was taken last Sunday morning for two of our pastors who have uh, had strokes and had been in the hospital for some time, Reverend Rahani, one of our multicultural pastors, and Reverend El Talabani pastor of our first church of the Nazarene in Lansing, you gave $1,260 last Sunday in that love offering, and that will be sent with all the other churches on the district and help these two fine men with their expenses. Again, thank you for your expressions of love. Thank all of you for being with us today. Let's continue in our worship experience.
Amen. That was promise, and you're going to be hearing from them a little bit later. Now it's your turn to let all the people praise Him. You're going to want to keep your bulletins handy because there are words to choruses there. But first, would you join me turning in your hymnal to number 61. Number 61. Magnify the Lord with me, ye people of His choice. months ago our music minister introduced a new chorus to those of us at First Church and we'd like to teach that to those of you who are visitors this morning congregation you join in with us on the first time through this the choir is going to sing it for you one time and teach it to you it's there in your bulletin and then would you join in with us
think he's really enjoying our praise. Would you sing that through one more time? Jesus, we crown you with our praise.
ends of the earth shall praise the O Lord when they hear the words of thine mouth. Yes, they shall sing of thy way. to sing. Would you stand with me and sing that? This morning, I want to draw family, church family's attention to the fact that three of our families have experienced losses in their homes. Mike Love's grandfather passed away. Doris Rambo, a longtime member of this congregation, passed away, and we want to remember her family along with Roy Case. And then also the family of Sherry Sipple was killed in an auto accident this past Thursday. And then Terry Calvin, we want to continue praying during his uh, cancer treatment. Sam and Jill Cowserts. We're praying for their unborn baby and also for Pat Warner, Norma Morgan, and Dr. Judy Whitus. All of these people are recovering from their recent surgeries. Let us pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we bow our heads in grateful recognition that you are our Father. Know what a privilege it is to be in a setting like this today. And we realize that the only reason that we are gathered here today is because of your Son, Jesus Christ. If you hadn't loved us enough to send him to this world to suffer for us and to bear our sins in his bodies, we wouldn't have any reason to gather like this. The songs that we have sung and that we have heard sung would have no reason and no meaning. But oh, how we love you this morning. How are we bow our heads and praise your name this morning. We thank you for a family of God that cares for each other, loves each other. And Father, we've always prayed that this place would be a safe place. A place where we can come and put aside all pretenses. Put aside colors, put aside backgrounds, put aside places where we were born. And just remember that in Jesus Christ, truly, we are brothers and sisters together. We thank you this morning for your son, for the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for our special guests, for our visitors. We thank you for a a university that still is committed to Christian principles. Father, we thank you for those who have been here and walked inside her hallowed halls and have gone out to various parts of the world and still proclaim the message of that Jesus saves. And we pray that it will always be that way. We thank you for those who have left their own home churches to be here today, and we pray that you'll bless each one of them abundantly. Father, you recognize the needs of this congregation, and we realize this is only a portion of them. But we pray, Father, that each one of our people will sense your presence today and sense that truly there are people who care and that prayers are going out on their behalf. Father, we pray for Dr. Lee as he speaks the word of God to us this morning. We pray that you'll minister through him as he speaks to us. And we pray that this whole day would bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for promise and these beautiful young men that you've once again brought our way. We just pray that you'll continue to minister through them and encourage them and strengthen them in their ministry of music. Father, we thank you for this land that we live in today. We realize that tomorrow we will be celebrating Veterans Day. And we realize that many men and women from this congregation and throughout the world have literally given of their young people that we might enjoy the freedom that we are enjoying today. For we realize there are still countries that would not be able to hold a service like we're holding today. The world they live in would forbid it. Father, we do pray for the President of our United States. We pray for all these newly elected men and women who will be taking their places. Father, we do pray that you'll give to them the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that they need to guide and direct the, the, the constituencies that they represent. Give to us continually men and women with high moral standards who are not ashamed to call you Father and not ashamed to call Jesus their Savior. Once again, we thank you for this day. We lift up the name of Jesus Christ truly in all that we do in whose name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. I just have to believe there are a whole lot of us this morning who feel like they're going to explode with praise this morning. Are you there? I think this has been a great time of praise this morning together. And don't you just feel like you should do something else? (laughs) Come here laughing. We want to continue this worship time as we give back to God his tithes and our offerings this morning. Just out of the joy of our hearts, let's give to him. As our ushers come, I want to uh, remind you to place your uh, registration cards in the offering plate as they come around, and that helps us get better acquainted with you this week. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time to gather together from really many parts of the United States, and we thank you that as we come together this morning, we come together as one in you, and we thank you for the time that we can have together in praise and just a little touch of what heaven will be like. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to praise you. We thank you for being here amongst us this morning. Pray that you would bless our gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
though Satan should buffet and trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well. I know you just sat down, but you're going to have to sit for a long time after Dr. Lee gets up here, so <laughs> just kidding, brother. So would you stand again and let's sing This Is My Story. each one of you with us. Would you turn and greet one another in the name of Jesus?
Apology to these fine men. George and Brian and yeah, Mark <laughs> and Eric. I forgot to mention they were our special guest also. And I'll tell you what, I'm gonna make it up to you. You can sing again tonight. <laughs> okay? That's worth coming back for. Dr. Lee and promise you can't beat it, folks. I'll tell you what, I'd come back. I'm gonna come back. I just decided that right now. <laughs> well, homecoming is fun. And it's enjoyable, and it's always exciting, and we always look forward to it so we can triple our attendance for one thing. But anyway, <laughs> just beyond that, we look forward to the wonderful, wonderful experience of being together once again and sharing all the experiences. We couldn't have had anyone that any of us here at this congregation, many of you who have known Dr. Lee over the years as his association with uh, Olivet Nazarene University, and now District Superintendent of the Indianapolis District, it's a delight to have you with us. And before you come, though, Ted, Got to make Bev stand up. I'm going to do this. She can't get to me later on. Beverly, I want them to see who, who really makes this man. Yes. Thanks, Ron. I love you, brother. Our Heavenly Father, our hearts are so overflowing this morning. We're trying to regain our composure. But we just feel like saying glory, hallelujah. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for all that we have sensed here today. And we thank you for the beautiful music, this magnificent choir, and our worship leader today, and promise, and this wonderful, wonderful pastor, and Dr. Doolittle. And Lord, the family has gathered here this morning. And I have some former classmates that are here this morning as well. And God, you know, that can be spooky. But Lord, we're glad to see them. And we're just glad for everybody that's here today. Now, Lord, bless us these next few moments together. And just let this be a time when we just reach out and touch you in a brand new way. And let this be a time when we just say, God, regardless of what has transpired in our lives, we have made up our mind that we're going to make it to heaven. And we're going to have a home. You can't go home again in the 50 years since it was written. You can't go home again has become a classic. We know that a classic is any piece of literature or music which has lost its timelessness and now speaks to all generations, not just the generation to whom it was created. Thomas Wolfe was born in Asheville, North Carolina in 1900. His mother ran a boarding house and his father was a drunk. After graduating from the University of North Carolina, he went on to Harvard. Following graduation from Harvard, he moved to New York City, and it was while he was living in New York that he became a writer. After two successful novels, he decided to return to Asheville to go back to his roots and write a book about the unforgettable, unique, unusual people and places that he knew as a child. But when he returned, 
he soon realized that many that he remembered had died. Others had moved away. Why, the old covered bridge that he used to play on day after day was no longer there. Main Street was not what he remembered as he walked up and down the street and people did not recognize him and he did not recognize them and many of the buildings that he remembered, they had now gone out of business and so he wrote a book with some bitterness and called it, You Can't Go Home Again. Following the war, General Douglas MacArthur he tried to go home again. He went back to his fond childhood days of San Antonio, Texas. He related in his autobiography that when he arrived in San Antonio that afternoon, it was a beautiful day. He said it seemed as if the sun was beating and he said the trees were so beautiful and he was anxious to see that home where he grew up when that great stately general when he finally found the street and noticed and looked up and saw the house that he grew up as a kid, he walked up the steps and there was a lady sitting on the porch and she did not know him and she looked at him and said, What are you doing? Who are you? If you don't leave my property, I'm going to call the police right now. General Douglas MacArthur, he didn't even try to explain. He agreed with Thomas Wolfe, You can't go home again on this homecoming Sunday. There are very few people here who would not like to turn the clock back or tear some years off of the calendar to enjoy a former era when life was happier, more rewarding, and more fulfilling. I was in the lobby last evening of the beautiful Les Parrot Mackay Arena. And some friends of mine walked up to me that I had not seen for a little while. And it wasn't long as they looked at me and they said, Ted, you used to have black hair. One of them said, you used to be thin. I said, but I can still button my coat. They said, anybody can do that if they get them large enough. And one of them said to me, he said, you know, he said, I have a lot of aches and pains. He said, remember when we used to play with Delta on the societies and how we always would win the championship in basketball? And then his voice trailed off and he said, I'm afraid I can't do that anymore. I have too many aches and pains. And even though we would like to remember those happier days and recapture those times, Time has taken its toll on us, and our vigor is not the same. Our stamina is not the same. Why, I'm looking at people right now, and you well remember that first love on the campus of Olivet Nazarene College at that time. And that little girl came into your eyes, and she was the most beautiful girl you had ever seen in your life. And you knew that that marriage would last forever and ever. And the joy bells would always ring. And there would be happiness the rest of your lives. But reality has set in. And the joy of our marriages is not what they used to be. I'm looking at people here today. And you would like to recapture that enthusiasm. When you walked across that platform years ago. And receive the diploma from the president of Olivet at that time in your life. Why, when you got that diploma and you threw that cap in the air and you rolled your sleeves up, you were going to change your world. You were going to make an impact on Wall Street. You were going to be the best coach that the world has ever known. You had just graduated from college. You were ready now to take the world. But the years have now gone by. You have not quite made it to Wall Street. That job that you were going to have that was going to invigorate you and energize you the rest of your life, something has now happened. We have had downsizing this past decade or so, and you are now out of a job, or you've had to retool and retrain. You got caught up in the politics of the day and perhaps lost your job and you were doing the very best you knew how. 
life isn't fair, Brother Lee. No, life is not fair in one way or another. Most of us would like to go home again to some happier time or place when life was lived under a clear blue sky and the wind was in our back and we didn't have a problem in the world. But the fact still remains. We can't go home again for life has moved on. But here's the key question this morning. In the time allotted to me, the question is this. If we can't go home again, what can you do? What can we do if we can't go home again? Oh, I think of St. Paul. Paul was coming to the end of his life. Biblical scholars say that he was probably 64, 65 years of age. He was now in a Roman prison. It was dark. It was dingy. He had a ball and chain on him. One of his friends stopped by, brought him some supplies, and said, Paul, we want to talk to you and tell you about the old home place. We just want to tell you that people are still serving God. The Bible said his friend got sick, had to return home. Paul was writing him a letter to tell him to take the letter back to his friends and read the letter to them. Why, if there's ever anyone who may have wished he could go home again, it was Paul, but he couldn't go home again. If we can't go home again, what can we do? First of all, we can enjoy the memory. We can enjoy the memory. I love what Paul said in Philippians, the fourth chapter, when he said this, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And all, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad for the memories. I'm glad for precious memories today that no one can take away from us. John the Revelator, talking in Revelations, the fifth chapter, talking about the memory bank of the saints. He said when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them their harps and the golden vases full of incense, which are the prayers of saints. Ladies and gentlemen, every prayer that we have prayed, every heartache that we have gone through, every Gethsemane that's taken its toll on our lives, God knows all about that, why they are kept in the memory bank of God, and we have our memory today. A few weeks ago, we had board of trustee meeting at Olivet, Rather a unique experience for me. I'm now on the board. I don't let anybody forget it. I've had more bribes from Doug Perry and Gary Streit than you can imagine. For 24 years, I reported to the board, and now I'm on the board of trustees. Kind of funny. But I got to the board meeting a little early that day. Mrs. Lee was not with me. I was alone. And I guess I took a little bit of what we would call a sentimental journey of the years when I was a student at Olivet. Before going to the E.W. Martin boardroom, I went into the second floor and I began to look at the archives that are up there and It hasn't been that many months since I left Olivet, but they have already had some changes with new faculty. You can't go home again. Things change, you know. I begin to look at the names on the door. Suddenly, I begin to think of my days at Olivet. I begin to think of the J.F. Leist and the Moody Johnson and the Forrest Benners and the J. Otis Says and the Ralph Perry 
that many times when we would go to class after a chapel service where the presence of God would come and Ralph Perry would say, gentlemen, I have a lecture and class is important, but God wants us to pray today. And we'd get down on our knees and we'd have a prayer meeting. And I had a flood of memories in my mind a few weeks ago. I thought about the Dwight Stricklers and the Carl McLeans that had that nervous gesture where he would always clear his throat. I thought about the four dice Bennetts, and I began to say to myself, you know, Ted, none of these individuals are around here anymore. They have either gone to be with the Lord or they have now retired. I walked on across campus. When I was a student at Olivet, we didn't have an esplanade. In fact, we didn't know what it was. And God knows we couldn't spell it. But where the esplanade is used to be the tennis courts. I walked over by Chapman Hall. I looked down in the basement. We now have the home economics department down there. I remember as a student, we had the snack bar called the universe. Why you have never lived till you have had a cheeseburger in the universe. Why we work more professors over in the universe. We took on the church more in that area than what you can ever imagine. Why I begin to think of the Yule log. We lit that at every Christmas season. That's the first time I met Dr. Mary Margaret Reed. I was reading the scripture. I was a senior. We were writing, we were lighting the Yule log. What an experience that was. I remembered Mrs. Wellman's tea room. Now I know the younger ones don't have a clue what I'm talking about this morning, but I am trying to tell you, you can't go home again. I'd give anything in the world today if I could have one of those hot cinnamon rolls with butter oozing all over it. And I see heads nodding today. Many of you know what I'm talking about in Mrs. Wellman's tea room. I thought about Flareman Hall. Why I had many classes in Flareman Hall. Why the boards were so wide, we'd have to shake the snow off of our desk many times before we could start the class. Why the building had been condemned for 40 years. The inspector just didn't know how to find it. What a classroom that was. (laughs) We didn't have Reed Hall of Science. We didn't have a planetarium. We didn't have the Les Parrott Convocation, beautiful Mackay Arena. We didn't have Snowbarger Athletic Park. We didn't have football stadium. We didn't even have intercollegiate sports. I remember the first basketball game. Lon Williams was thin then as well. He played on that team that well with his brother and many others. We didn't have the beautiful facilities that we now have at Olivet. But I've got to tell you today, for remember I told you I was on a sentimental journey. I wish this morning it would have been possible to recapture some of those joys of that era when I was around Olivet. We had great times of fun, bonding with friends. Why, we had revivals that went Sunday over Sunday. We had chapel four times a week. And oh, yes, we got tired back then, just like you get tired with two days a week. But that's when Olivet was spiritual. We really had it back there, you know, in that day. I remember those times when the altars were lied. I'll never forget my senior year when revival came. Dr. and Mrs. Mendel Taylor were the workers that year. I can't remember. I can't believe I still remember that. I can see Mendel Taylor now in the prime of his life, crawling on his hands and knees from one end of that altar to the other and putting his arms around those students. And he came to me that day and he said, Ted, God's got something special for you. And that's been many, many years. And he said to me, Ted Lee, God will never fail you. And I found that to be so. Sure, I wish I could recapture some things. Sure, I wish there'd be some things different in my life, but I realized this morning that I can't go home again. I remember when Dr. Reed was there as president. 
I remember the first big blue Cadillac that he bought. It looked like Queen Mary pulling it on campus. That precious man, and God bless his memory, that was when Tilt Wheel was first coming out. He drove around campus for two weeks with his arms up in the air like that. True story. Finally, Jim Tripp got in the car one day to take Dr. Reed somewhere, reached up and took the handle and pulled the steering wheel down. And Dr. Reed said, what are you doing? What are you doing? You broke my wheel. You broke my wheel. <laughs> he was our college president. <laughs> and we loved him. I left there and I drove over to Trailerville. Well, you say, where's that? It's still there. It's in my memory. My wife and I didn't have two nickels to rub together, but that was some of the happiest days of our lives. We had all jump in and put our popcorn together on Friday nights, and she was working, and I was working, and everybody was working. I remember the high moment when we lived in Trailerville is when I ran for mayor. <laughs> Don't laugh, I won. Great turnout, great platform. Harold Fry, 26 votes. Ted Lee, 28. Yes! <laughs> My platform was to have a Coke machine in the laundromat. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Took us six months to do it. We threatened, but we got it. What a day that was. What a mayor I was. I taught the esteemed mayor, Mayor Grover Brooks, everything he knows about being mayor. That's the reason he's such a great mayor today, for he was a part of that era with me. I'm glad today that I still have memories. I'm glad for Ruth Lane, the school nurse. I used to go see her every Monday morning because I'd have a sore throat because I'd preach too loud the days before. She'd say to me, Ted Lee, you're just like E.O. Chalfin. If you'd quit screaming so much, I wouldn't have to give you this medicine. I'd say, I know, Ruth, I know. What a sweetheart she was. I remember the camp engineer and Ed Brodeen when I arrived on campus. And I remember Charles Henderson, the business manager. What a neat man he was. Why, he purchased everything from petrified prunes to left-handed boxing gloves. But we all loved Charlie Henderson, and he impacted our lives. I wish today I could go home again here this morning. I listened to Promise sing today. I love those guys. I've been in Indian, Bev and I have been in Indianapolis now for uh, 15 months, I guess. And I've had two camp meetings and one Christmas party. I've had promise at both of my camp meetings and at my district Christmas party already. And I love them. But Beverly said to me one day, she said, do you know why you like promise so well? I said, no, tell me. She said, you're trying to recapture the joy of the old churchman quartet that you put together 30 years ago. Can you imagine, Don Reddick, you're that old wherever you are? There he is. Don was a pianist in the old churchman quartet. I love those guys. They drove me crazy. Dale DeFoe would drive anybody crazy. Mark Murphy, Doug Bias. Doug died a couple years ago, first one of the group that died. Doug made peace with God before he died. We all showed up to the funeral. A lot of you were there. I preached Doug's funeral that day. We cried. We all gathered in a circle, and Dale DeFoe led us in prayer. And we made up our mind that the circle would not be broken, that we were all going to make it to heaven. I won't mention her last name today because I don't want to embarrass her. But there was a beautiful girl during their era, and she's a beautiful lady still today, and her name is Janet. And she had a crush on every one of the churchmen, and I think at the same time. <laughs> she was at Doug's funeral. She stood in the hallway of the church and wiping her eyes, and she said, Well, I guess I might as well admit it. Here I am at my age. I'm just a churchman groupie. <laughs> she said, I'm going to attend all of their funerals, and they can count on that. Ah, I thought about those things today, and 
thinking about if we can recapture those joys in our life when it seems like that we didn't have so many, so much stress and the problems that we deal with now. But let me say to you again, we can't go home again. But thank God for the memories. Thank God for the memories that no one can take away from us. Secondly, this morning, not only do we have the memories, but secondly, we need to accept the realities of the situation where we are here and now. Paul had to do that. Paul said in verse 11, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. I say to you today, ladies and gentlemen, we so many times, we get stressed out. We have health problems. We try to change things today that, frankly, we cannot change. We may have dedicated our kids to God when they were just a baby, but every one of our kids have a will. They may grow up someday and break our hearts, and all we have are the memories of how it used to be. I don't like downsizing any more than you. I met with one of my fine men on my district just last week, been an executive for many years. He's now bitter. Downsizing is taking its toll. He's now lost his job. He smacked his fist down at Bob Evans on Highway 31. He said, Brother Lee, you don't understand. It's just not fair. I know that. I know today, going on 55 years of age, that Billy Graham does not need my services. I knew he would my senior year in college. I was waiting any moment for that call that I'd be groomed to take his place. I'm not. Those things, those dreams that we had, and nothing wrong to dream, young people. Set your goals high. But many of those dreams are never going to become a reality for life is going by. But I can say to you today, as the Apostle Paul said, in a dark, dingy, cold prison, he said, I am content. Why am I content? Because my hope is not in the things down here. My hope are in the things over there. And I belong to him. And he belongs to me. And we need to accept the realities of the situation today and move on. Thirdly, today and lastly, not only do we have the memories, not only do we need to accept the realities of our situation, but thirdly, we need to have a strong hand in our own future. Nobody else can do it for us. We have to do that. We cannot blame mom and dad. It seems like now, and I'm not putting anybody down today, and I'm not trying to hurt anybody by saying this. But if we have something wrong in our lives today, it's pretty easy to talk about a dysfunctional family. And it's the parents' fault 30 years ago. I say to you, get a life. And I know you may have been hurt. And I know sexual and child abuse is not fun. And I know those kind of memories are not real. But accept the reality of it and move on and take a hand in your own life and do not wallow in self-pity any longer. Have a strong hand in your own future. Paul did. For Paul said, I can do all things. Through Christ, which gives me strength. I do not like my realities, but I accept them. I can remember what used to be on the Damascus Road. But I'm not going to wallow in self-pity. I can't go home again. I can't recapture those days in my life that I would like to recapture. But I can say one thing today. I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. I know that God has brought me this far and he hasn't failed me yet. I guess the older I become, 
doesn't sound very nice, and I'm not putting myself down, but I think I'm regressing. I really do, Pastor. When I was young, I was smart. I knew the answers. I was smarter than the general superintendents. I knew more than Dr. Says. I, you know, when I was young, I had all the answers. I don't know much anymore. Got up this morning to come here. Beverly said to me, let me look at you before you leave. (laughs) It was not a romantic thing. (laughs) Unfortunately. I don't know a lot anymore. And let me repeat myself by saying, I'm not trying to put myself down. For the older I become, the more I know that I need you. I need my friends. I need my pastors. I need my wife. I need my daughter. I need Spencer and Katie and Ellie, which I'm not allowed to talk from from the platform because Beverly says everybody has grandkids and don't talk about ours. And I need my dad. All I have now is memories of him. He's gone. But somewhere in the midst of all my journey of life, mountain peaks that I've had and a few valleys. But I was a little boy. My mother taught me a little chorus that went something like this. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. And I learned in Bible school when I was a little boy, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And in times of my life when things were going well and the wind was at my back and the sky was blue and I thought I was pretty cool and I was making it well, I didn't always think about Jesus loves me, this I know, and quote the scriptures. But it's times when I realize that the church is going to make it without me or without me, with me or without me. It's times when I have been going through some searching in my life and saying, Lord, why? It's not fair. But thank God for a memory that came back. Jesus loves me as I know. And I told you this morning, and I don't want to contradict myself in closing, but I told you this morning you can't go home again. You can't. You can't recapture those joys in the earlier years because life moves on. But there is a home that we could go to someday. A home where we're all going to be winners. And NNC is not going to beat us by one point. And I don't know what all it's going to be like up there. I really don't. But I got to tell you today, crowd, I believe in a place called heaven. And heaven is going to be real. And we don't have to have only memories. I'm told when we get there. For John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old earth had passed away. There was no more sorrow. There was no more pain. Write what is true. And it is going to be real. A few weeks ago, this and I'm all done. Many of you remember Dr. Rose Burkhart, perhaps, that taught English on our campus for a few years. 
she died a couple years ago, and I've known her all of my life. And the only body that's living in her family is her sister Alma. And Rose, Dr. Rose Burkhart was 91 when she died, and her sister was 89. Her sister's now 91. So Alma called me and said, Ted, sis wanted you to preach her funeral. Will you come to Richmond, Indiana and preach sis's funeral? There won't be many there. Oh, I said, Alma. I said, I'm honored to do that. And I did. My dad pastored Richmond, Indiana for 13 years. So that's kind of home, I guess. That's where Bev's from. That's where her mother lives. I see her once every quadranium. <laughs> but every time I'm in Richmond, most every time, I always try to stop by and see Alma Burkhart. Her mom and dad got converted when my dad was pastor at Richmond, old German family. Alma, as I said, is 91 now, maybe 92. The most beautiful 92-year-old lady I've ever seen in my life. Has flowing white hair that looks like she gets it done every day professionally. She still mows her own grass with a push lawnmower. She exercises every day of the world. She always, when I ever always stop by, she always has frozen banana nut bread for me to take home and fresh chocolate chip cookies. It's amazing how that's why I stop by quite often, as you can tell. <laughs> and for as long as I can remember, really, since I've been on my own and traveling for Olivet and now in Indianapolis, that great city, whenever I'd stop by and see Alma and always have prayer with her, She'd always get down on her knees after I'd finished praying, and she'd always take me by the hand and always pray for me and always say nice things about me. She remembered me as a kid growing up. So about uh, three weeks, four weeks ago now, whenever it was, it doesn't matter, I got a call one afternoon from a nursing home slash hospital uh, there in Richmond. It has a nursing home on one side and a hospital care on the other. And the nurse said that Alma Burkhart was in the hospital and was calling for Beverly and me and wanted us to come and see her, which she had never called and asked us to do that. So that weekend we had our district layman's retreat. And so Saturday afternoon we drove about 60 miles, I guess, from where our retreat was and got to Richmond and identified ourselves there at the nurse's station. And the nurse said that she had not slept well that night and was heavily sedated and she might be asleep. And we said we will not bother her if she is. And walked into that room, and there that precious 92-year-old lady was, her hair still perfect, not a hair out of place, an incredible lady. And they had pillows all around her because her spine is deteriorating, and she was in such horrible, horrible pain. She was asleep. We stood there a while, then we left, and then we came back, and finally Beverly went up to her and very gently began to caress her cheek and rub her hair. And Alma woke up. As soon as she woke up, awoke and looked at us and uh, that smile, those shiny teeth, she smiled and said, I knew you'd come. So we talked for a while. Didn't want to overdo it. She was in a lot of pain, heavily sedated. Beverly kept rubbing her brow, rubbing her hair, patting her cheek. Oh, well, finally I said, Alma, we've got to go. I'll be back in a couple of weeks and see you. So I kind of sat out on the edge of the bed, took her by her little frail hand. Alma Burkhart wouldn't weigh 90 pounds soaking wet carrying books, just a little precious lady. I took her by the hand and I said, Alma, I said, I'm going to pray now that Jesus touches you. I said, I need some more chocolate chip cookies. And I said, I want you to soon be able to go home. She got, she took a breath and got as loud as she could, which wasn't very loud, and said, no, no, Ted, don't pray that I go home here. I've been here long enough. I want to go home over there with Jesus. Never forget that. So I did. God, thank you for Alma, who I've known for most of my life. 
Thank you for all she's meant to me. Thank you for her good life. Now, Jesus, may her home going be in dignity. Just make her comfortable. Her sis is waiting for her. Her mom and dad are waiting for her. Thank you for the impact she's made on my life. I love her, Lord. Amen. I patted her. Dad. Yes, Alma. Come here. Yes. It's my turn. Oh, Alma. No. I want to pray for you. Okay. Took my hand. Jesus, be with my boy, Ted. Thank you for his life. I've watched him grow up. Thank you that he's been so good to me. Thank you for Beverly. I love her too. We'll be together someday forever. Amen. I thanked her. Kissed her on the cheek. I left the room. Beverly was still patting her, pulling the blankets up around her, tucking her in. By the time Beverly got out there, I uh, was standing in the parking lot. I wasn't broken. I wasn't crying. But we got in the car and started out of that driveway of that home hospital. I said, Beverly, what a beautiful way to come to the end of life's journey. I said, with all of the junk, I said this to Beverly, and all the things you deal with and all the trying to do this right and that right and all that we want to do in life, I want to live, Beverly, and I want to love you, and I want to be a good husband, and I want to be a good dad. And when I come to the end of life's way, I want to be able to say to the preacher, don't pray that I stay home here. I've been here long enough. I want to go home to a real homecoming, Gene Snow. Can we do that, Brother Lee? Yes. How? Be faithful. Be faithful. Don't be bitter. Don't try to recapture what you could not recapture. Except have a hand in your own life. And let us be faithful to those that come behind us.
and our children sift through all we've left behind. Oh, may the clues that they discover and those memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. Dr. Ted Lee. Thank you, Promise. Thank you, Brian, for being with us today. And we are going to close our service this morning by recognizing in a special way our Veterans Day that's tomorrow. We're privileged to have as a member of this congregation Dr. Lowell Malliette, who is also Commander Lowell Malliette in the United States Navy Chaplain Corps. And we're asking him to come and close our service in prayer. Again, we want to thank all of you for being with us and making this a very special homecoming day. Let's stand as we close our service in prayer. I was thinking the most appropriate way that we could end this service was to just say, Amen. But uh, let us uh, pray just for a few moments and uh, bring God's benediction down upon this time together. We thank Thee, our Heavenly Father, for homecoming celebrations that bring